The meeting of rules, privileges, and elections is now called to order. I would also, wait, I don't have my glasses. Good morning and welcome to the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections. My name is Karen Koslowitz and I am chair of this committee. Before we begin this hearing, I would like to introduce the council members of the committee who have joined us today. Our speaker, Corey Johnson, Minority Leader Stephen Matteo, Council Member Margaret Chin, and Council Member Debbie Rose. And we will be joined by others shortly. Council Member Brad Landa has joined us. Not on the committee, but he has joined us. I would also like to acknowledge Rules Committee Council Lance Polivi and the staff members of the Council's Investigative Unit, Chuck Davis, Chief Compliance Officer, and Investigators Andre Johnson Brown, Alicia Vassell, Desiree Robinson, and Ramses Booten. Today, the Rules Committee will consider the nomination of Georgia. Pestane for appointment to the position of Corporation Counsel. This is the first time a Corporation Counsel nominee has been before the Council for our advice and consent after the 2019 Charter Revision Commission made this recommendation and it was ratified by the city electorate. If the Council gives the advice and consent, Ms. Pestane will fill the vacancy for a corporation council and serve an indefinite term at a salary of 200. Pestana. Pestana? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Pestana. $240,000, $243,000. It says here, Chuck confirmed the exact amount. It's okay? Okay, I just wanna, we've been joined by council members, Keith Powers and Adrian Adams. The New York City Charter designates the Corporation Council as the attorney and counsel for the city and all city agencies. The Corporation Council and by extension, the Law Department is granted the power to conduct all of the law business of the city. Further, the Corporation Council shall have the right to bring or defend any legal action in local, state, or federal courts. The Law Department is comprised of approximately 1,000 attorneys who specialize in all of the types of law that may be necessary to conduct the legal business of the city. The Law Department includes specialists in a multitude of fields of litigation, land use, ethics, professional responsibility, contracts, administrative law, juvenile delinquency, and legislative interpretation. Just to name a few, they represent the city elected officials and city agencies with any and all legal issues they may confront. The mayor must submit the name of a nominee for corporation council within 60 days of a vacancy to the city council for its advice and consent. I wanna welcome our candidate, and um, raise your right hand, please, to be sworn in. Ms. Pistana, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do you wish to make an opening statement? I was wondering. Good morning, Chair Kaslowitz, Speaker Johnson, and distinguished members of the Rules, Privileges, and Elections Committee. It is a pleasure to come before you to introduce myself and answer your questions relating to my nomination for appointment 
as New York City's 80th Corporation Counsel. Having worked at the Law Department for more than 33 years, words can't do justice to how honored I am to be before you for consideration for this appointment. As the mayor and others have noted since my nomination, I am the first woman and the first Latina to be nominated to lead an office with such a long history. The significance of those facts is humbling, but to my knowledge, I would also be the first attorney who progressed through the ranks of the law department and was then selected to be corporation counsel, subject, of course, to your consideration. I believe my training and experience over 33 plus years as an attorney representing the city, its officials, including the council and its members, and municipal employees in a wide variety of matters more than qualifies me to hold the position of corporation counsel. Everything that I have learned from my exceptional colleagues and supervisors, as well as from my clients in multiple administrations and agencies, and from my interactions with a variety of elected officials and their staffs, has shaped the lawyer that I am today. In my very first days at the Law Department, my first supervisor took care to explain that my obligation is to the city as a whole, and that I should always keep in mind that while it is nice to win, my job is to achieve the right results. Throughout my career, that has been the guiding principle of my work. Sometimes it is really difficult to know what the right result is, and as I progressed through the ranks of the Law Department, it became harder and harder as the issues became more complex, often involving competing legitimate interests. In all cases, it has been vitally important to listen to my clients. While I know or I can learn the law, my clients know the facts and the problems close up and are critically important to the analysis and to finding the solution. At the same time, the Law Department has more distance than our clients from issues presented and has less invested in defending the way things are so that we can offer a more dispassionate assessment of problems and proposed solutions. Throughout my career, I have done my best on behalf of the City of New York and in furtherance of the rule of law. My history and experience has prepared me well for the role of Corporation Counsel. I respectfully request that you give me the opportunity to serve as the Chief Legal Officer of the City of New York. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you. I now want to recognize the speaker who may wish to make an opening statement and ask you some questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Kozlowitz. Good morning, uh, Ms. Pistana. Thank you for joining us today. I want to commend you on your <clears throat> impressive background and thank you for your decades of service for the city that we all love. As you know, we are here today, as the chair said, because I called for a charter revision commission in 2019 and the commission recommended that the Corporation Council come before the city council for its advice and consent. One of the reasons for this change in practice is that the Corporation Council is charged with serving as the lawyer for the city as a whole. However, since the 1989 charter made the council the mayor's co-equal branch in government, there have been times when it has not seemed like the law department has given sufficient attention to the council and other independently elected officials when their interests differed from the legal positions of the mayor. To start back before you were in executive positions at the law department, during the Giuliani administration, many thought he used the law department to abuse his powers, especially whenever the First Amendment was involved. He went after those who said and displayed things he found offensive, and he used the law department to do it when there was very little support and a lot of opposition from other city elected officials. Then continuing under Mayor Bloomberg, there were several instances of the law department arguing that the council, and by extension the city, was preempted from acting in a given area by state law. There were also instances where the law department supported a mayoral position that the city lacked home rule authority to act in areas where the city had acted for decades around taxicab medallions. In fact, in the case about the prevailing wage law, the law department argued Mayor Bloomberg's position and chose not to defend a duly enacted city law. Then when Mayor Bloomberg left office, the law department reversed itself and supported the new mayor's position, stating that, quote, the administration now agrees with the council and interveners that the prevailing wage law is not preempted. This was the exact opposite position from when the law department took orders 
from the mayor to sue the council, attempting to overturn a duly enacted city law. This type of legal flip-flopping undermines public confidence in the law department's ability to make decisions about the legal position of the city in a thoughtful and impartial manner. Fortunately, we have had fewer of those instances recently, but there have still been instances where we feel like the council has been treated less like a client of the law department and more like an afterthought. Let me give you some examples. We have received drafts of briefs on important cases regarding the council and city powers merely hours before comments are due and told by the law department we have a few hours to get them in or we would not be included. We are not promptly notified when city council members are sued and recently were only notified that a council member was named as a defendant in a case that had been filed months earlier. The law department did not give us the courtesy of telling us that a council member was being sued. In briefs involving claims against the mayor and council members, the arguments defending the mayor routinely are the focus of the vast majority of briefs with a short section about the council only included at the very end of those briefs. The law department has refused to make persuasive legal arguments to defend city laws if the arguments are critical of the NYPD. The council has learned about important court opinions in some of our major cases by reading about them in the press instead of receiving them promptly from the law department who is supposed to be acting as the city council's lawyers as well. If the corporation council is to fulfill their charter mandate as the lawyer for the entire city, the council cannot be treated like this. Mayoral agencies may not want to be closely involved in cases that seem more routine and given your role in working with executive agency lawyers that may be justifiable at times, but that is not the case with a separate and co-equal branch of government. Our staff here at the City Council takes litigation on behalf of the Council and our members with a high level of seriousness, the high level of seriousness that it requires. To be sure, there are divisions of the Law Department who work amazingly well with our lawyers and consult very closely with them. They even have drafted briefs together, and I want to point that out. I don't want to paint with a broad brush. We would like that to become the norm when issues of importance to the council, including our legislative powers, are at stake. So I am really glad you are here today. We want to make sure that all of city government sees the corporation council as their lawyer. And I know some of my colleagues will explore many of these issues further, but I want to jump right in with some questions, if that's okay. Sure. Thank you. So the first question I have is about amicus briefs. Uh, the law department has prevented the city council from filing amicus briefs, advancing arguments that espouse positions opposing those of the mayor. Why is the law department the correct actor to determine whether the council can file such a brief? Don't you think that the law department will always have a conflict? because the law department will never want to allow the council to file a brief in opposition to your legal arguments in support of the mayor. The issue, <coughs> excuse me, the issue of amicus briefs has been a contentious one uh, between uh, the law department or, and, and the council. The law department under the charter is the chief legal officer of the city and in litigation, the city must speak with one voice when the council as a, as a body wishes to put in opposition to a position that the city is taking in litigation, the city is not speaking with one voice. And in the, sorry, in the past that, that has been an issue. When the, when the concern, however, goes to the powers of the council or the scope of its authority, I agree that that is an appropriate time for the council to, uh, be given either party status or amicus status. Uh, I think it's a different question when it's a individual council member or a group of council members, not, speak, not the council as a body. I think that individual council members have a, as much a right as anyone else to propose a submission of amicus brief on their own behalf and that of their constituents because they're not speak, trying to speak on behalf of the city. I know that's a 
a, a gray line sometimes, but that, that is the way I see it. I understand what you're saying, but, but you know, again, the Corporation Council is supposed to be the lawyer for the entire city, and uh, when the Corporation Council determines that the council's position uh, should not be represented in a way, it doesn't feel like you are, uh, or the Corporation Council, whoever they may be, uh, really take our role seriously as a separate and co-equal branch of government. My very strong preference is to resolve those disagreements between the co-equal branches of government in intergovernmental discussions, either among the principals or uh, we work, as you noted, in most instances work closely and well with council's legal staff to try to work it out amongst ourselves so that, and, and come, fo come up with a path forward that maybe not everybody loves, but everybody can live with. That is my, I, I believe that the council is as much a client as the administration as are the other elected officials and my strong preference is that my clients get along and figure out a path forward. I think everybody is looking for what's best for the city of New York and it's very difficult but I think we should always make that effort and not have battling briefs in a court of law because the courts aren't in a particularly good position to decide these issues either. I just don't think that's been the case in the past. I understand what you're saying, that that's your strong preference, but I don't think that the council's been treated that way by the Corporation Council's office when it comes to making sure that our views are represented if there is some differing nuance in opinion. So you're making a commitment to have those conversations in a serious way with council members and with the body. I am, and if there are, this is not the right forum to talk about particular cases that you mentioned in your opening, but I would be happy to speak with uh, your staff about those particular matters separately in a private conversation. Okay. Uh, do you think it is ever appropriate for the law department to argue that the city was preempted, that the city through its local legislative body is precluded by state or federal law from legislating on a certain manner I'm talking about from passing a duly enacted local law when there is a colorable argument that the city has such a power. So there's a strong presumption that duly enacted laws are valid. Um, and there are some exceptions to that principle. And if a local law is reasonably defensible, then that is the action. I really don't like the phrase colorable argument, in my mind that's okay, it passes the laugh test. I don't think that's the standard any of us want our legislation to, to be held to. So again, my preference is to try to, if, we, if there are concerns about preemption, those should be thrashed out before the law, it comes before the body for a vote to try to put us in the strongest defensible position as possible. Uh, so that the law actually gets to take effect. We don't want to, you to pass a law, you don't want to pass a law that will be struck down. Colorable makes me uh, a little, it's not strong enough. Okay, I mean, it, in the case of the living wage legislation that I mentioned in my opening statement, if once Mayor de Blasio assumed office, the Corporation Council's office was able to see the merit <clears throat> in the council's legal position that the city had the authority to legislate in the area of living wages, how could the law department have justified arguing for less city power in the same exact case under the previous mayor? I, I can't speak to that case or the decisions and arguments that were made in, by my predecessors. I wasn't involved in the decision making or the argument, so I, I can't really speak to but that. But I'm speaking generally. If you could think generally about, it, 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 doesn't it go to the credibility of the law department if uh, just two years earlier or three years earlier, the law department was stating uh, publicly and through legal briefs that the city did not have this power and then just a couple of years later the city said, nope, you do have the power. I mean, doesn't that go to the credibility of the law department. It is harmful to the credibility of the law department. That would break my heart, yes. 
So we shouldn't be. We shouldn't be doing that. We shouldn't be flip flopping. I don't. I would want to avoid that and find another <coughs> solution. And preferably, it's the solution before we get to that place where the we're challenging duly enacted law, or yep. anyone is challenging duly enacted law. That we should be able to come together and defend it. And I just want to uh, read something. A well-known Columbia law professor and a former city official, Richard Berfault who was on the Conflict of Interest Board, stated about the Bloomberg administration's legal legacy that, quote, there may be a conflict between the immediate political and policy needs of any mayoral administration with a willingness to use whatever legal tools are at hand, including state preemption, to advance its goals and the long-term interest of the city in being able to chart its own destiny with less interference from the state so my question after reading that statement is, how can you assure us that any future consideration of arguing preemption against a local law will center on the best long-term interests of the city in being able to chart its own destiny? I think that is an excellent principle to uphold. We are all interested in the best long-term interests of the city. No one wants to see this or argue that the city is curtailed in a way that is just is not a hard and fast um, conclusion. Thank you. Do you think it is ever appropriate for the law department to argue that the city lacks home rule authority to act in a certain area when again there is a, maybe I shouldn't use the, the, the language, a colorable argument that the state legislature cannot act without a home rule request from the city? I, I, I don't feel it's appropriate for me to make sweeping statements without sort of the actual facts in front of me, but I'm, I would not, as, as we just in sort of in this prior exchange, I would not be in favor of making any arguments that would diminish the city's powers and prerogatives. Okay. I can say that generally, but I can't speak to any particular matter without sort of the whole facts. Well, well, to give a, a specific instance that I hope you can speak to, in his talk on the legal legacy of Mayor Bloomberg, Professor Befault, who I just mentioned a few moments ago, said, quote, a particularly striking feature of the Bloomberg administration's approach to home rule is the attempt to blunt home rule by invoking state law and on at least one occasion actually securing the state law to limit the scope of the city's legal authority. He gave the example of the law department backing the mayor in giving back decades of city authority over taxicab medallions. How can giving up city regulations of its streets and transportation possibly serve the city in the long term? And if the city had for decades considered the issuance of taxi medallions a matter of local control, how could the law department at least not have tried to defend the city's authority there? Again, I'm not familiar with the facts and, and the background of that particular matter. I, I can only say that I don't believe that we should, the law department should be taking action or making arguments that would diminish the city's power and prerogatives. Okay, uh, many of uh, the questions uh, that I think members have and that the body has, have concerned the independence of the law department from the mayor. How can you assure the city council, just like the attorney general of the United States is supposed to be independent from whoever the president is, the corporation council is again supposed to act as the lure for the entire city, not just for the mayor of the city of New York. How can you assure the city council and the public that the law department under your leadership will be neutral as the lawyers for the city, as lawyers for the city when there are disputes between the legal positions of the mayor and non-mayoral city entities? My client, I think we began this with, my client is the city. It's not the mayor by himself, and it's not the council by itself. It's the city, and my strong preference is that we work these things out. I do not, I, it's a, always a struggle to balance the legitimate competing interests of all of your clients when uh, we have, you know, the mayor, the council, sometimes the controller, sometimes borough presidents. There's a lot of interest to balance, and I want the law department to be the neutral, to, to try to balance those interests and be the, the 
person that, or the entity that tries to find a solution that is in the best, that ultimately we can say is in the best interest of the city meets the interests of um, everyone. Is that going to be possible 100% of the time? I, I, probably not, but we need to try. And I think the law department would be a good neutral in those situations. I think this, the referendum that um, made this position subject to advice and consent adds to the credibility of the law department and their ability to do that. So I, for one, think it's a good thing. Okay. Uh, how can you assure us that what happened with the law department during the Giuliani years will not happen under your watch? One specific example that I mentioned in my opening statement uh, that I'd like you to address was when the Corporation Council stood next to then Mayor Giuliani and said that he had the right to stop duly appropriated funds from flowing to the Brooklyn Museum because he found their art offensive. This was contrary to the position taken by the Brooklyn Borough President, the City Council Speaker, the Public Advocate, the City's SIGs, a former Corporation Council who represented the City's cultural groups, and virtually every First Amendment expert in the City of New York. It also ended up being contrary to the position of the federal courts. To quote Victor Kovner, former Corporation Counsel, who I'm sure you know, he gave this quote before the 2019 Charter Revision Commission on the, law, on the Law Department's position in that case. He said, quote, I have to say it was not the finest moment for the Law Department. How do we ensure that the Law Department does not in the future take a legally infirm position that is adverse to every involved city official other than the mayor because the mayor wants the law department and the corporation council to take that position. I have to agree with Victor Kovner. It was not the law department's finest hour. What I can say to you forward going that my commitment as a lawyer and a lawyer for the city for over 30 years has been to the rule of law. And we look at the law and we apply it evenly and with the weight of precedent and, and the arguments that uh, are in the best interest of our clients. I have a commitment to the rule of law. And um, just a, a final uh, a question on this and then I'll turn it back to the chair. Uh, and can you, can you really uh, just uh, say to us, um, you know, steadfastly that the council speaker and the public advocate should uh, have been prohibited from filing their amicus brief in the Brooklyn Museum case if Michael Hess had been asked and denied permission because without his permission, they had no right to be heard. What I'm saying is to get back to that earlier point that I made, the then city council speaker and the then public advocate uh, wanted to file an amicus brief and they were denied the ability to do so. Do you think that that is appropriate? I would go, have to go back and see the purpose of the brief if they were arguing that there is some impact on the scope of their authority and powers. Certainly you sh the council and the speaker, the speaker and the public advocate, I'm sorry, uh, should have been given amicus status. Again, it, it really depends on what the what the um, goal and the, what's being challenged in the substance. It's hard to sort of do it in the vacuum, but if it goes to the powers and the scope of your authority as, in, as public officials, I, I would say yes, you get to file it. So the, 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 the council ended up filing the brief uh, and I believe the Corporation Council's office was not in favor of the council doing that. Uh, again, it showed that conflict between the law department, uh, you know, taking into consideration uh, other non-mayoral entities uh, being able to have their voices heard on a very important and public matter. I really appreciate you being here today. Uh, I really want to um, thank you for your decades of service to the city of New York. I think your uh, nomination uh, is exciting and I'm grateful to everything that you've done. Uh, I do think uh, that, again, there have been uh, many instances, uh, not just uh, many years ago, but even in recent years, of the staff at the Law Department, some staff at the Law Department, I think not really working with the council well. Some staff has worked really well with us, 
and other staff uh, treats us as an afterthought, uh, does not give us proper time consideration when legal issues are arising related to the city council, uh, giving us just a few hours notice to get in very serious uh, legal documents that are necessary, not informing us when there is potential litigation or there is not potential, when there's actual litigation against a council member or the city council. I would like to change that. I would like to you know, improve the relationship between the law department and the council uh, for the future. Institutionally, I think it's important both for the law department and for the city council to have a working relationship where it doesn't seem, where it doesn't feel like for whoever the speaker is or whoever individual council members are, or whoever the lawyers are that work here at the city council, the city council is an afterthought. That the, you know, that ultimately uh, notice gets sent to the mayor. What we're told often is, oh, sorry, we didn't tell you that. We told the mayor's office. We thought they were going to tell you. That is not the response. But that's what we hear quite often. I definitely agree with you that this is a relationship that could use some building. I, and the, the staff of the divisions that most commonly work with the council, the administrative and regulatory litigation division that works on defending a lot of your cases, as well as legal counsel, I know, work closely with the agency. The lawyers in other divisions that aren't so used to the relationship, they need to be trained up and recognize uh, that the council is, a, is also our client and an important one, and we can work on that. I also, with your permission, would like to speak with your staff more about the particular instances that you raised so that we can um, understand um, and, and they, we can both understand what happened there. That would be great. I would appreciate that. Thank you for being here today. I Thank want to you. turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd now like to recognize our minority leader, Steve Mattia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Um, I have some questions for you. So given the definition of associated persons in the conflict of interest law, do you agree that you are associated with a senior attorney at the law department? Yes, I am. And how are you associated with the person? We live together. I'm sorry? We live together. Um, have you ever recused yourself from any invol matter involving this per person's employment in 2015 when you first became assistant corporation counsel? I have been, 2015, no, when I became, uh, when I came on to the executive staff in 2013, I recused myself from all, well, all matters that he works on. So and you said, in 2013 you said? 2013 is when I got onto the executive okay. staff and that's when the supervisory relationship, you know, at least theoretically, started. So how was that done? Was it written documentation? Was it signed by a supervisor? It was done by me telling Michael Cardoza, who is the corporation counsel at the time who had promoted me, he was aware of the relationship, but then we set up a system where at that point, uh, the division that he works in was overseen by a different executive, Len Kerner. So there was, it would not have come up later on when that division, uh, and I can't remember, it might've been 2015, 2016, came under me when Len left, then we set up a firewall, basically a recusal that any matter that he works on goes to um, the managing attorney uh, Muriel Good True Font. So I don't even know when they're communicating. It just happens. So there was a process set up, but was it written? Was there documentation no, or signed by anybody? It was not written, no. Okay. So what about in 2019 or 2021 when you became acting corp counsel? It, it's been the same process. He continues to, when he need, when executive staff eyes are needed on something he's working on, he goes to Muriel. So you consulted, um, the Law Department Ethics Council, would that be fair to say? Uh, no, we did not. It was, we just continued the same practice that we had initiated back in 2015. That practice continued. So did you consult COIB at all? Uh, we consulted COIB recently and the, the advice they gave was to, you know, as long as we kept in place the system that we put in place, it was okay. So when did you get that um, answer from COIB? Was that written? Yes, that was Friday. Friday? This past Friday. So w why, don't, why didn't you um, get that back in 2019 or 2021? 
honestly it didn't occur to me to ask for that advisory opinion it was the process that we had put in place years earlier and it just continued it should i have been more vigilant uh yes so um you said you received it last friday i got it on friday yeah. and when did you contact them or request uh friday you got the same day yeah, now I'm thinking, was it Thursday or Friday? It was Thursday or Friday, but yes, Which I sent them fast. a letter and then they sent it back late that night. And that's, you have that in writing? Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever, ever supervise or make supervisory decisions regarding the appointment, um, including no. firing, hiring, promotion to motion, salary discipline? No. Um, what about supervising any litigation matters from 2013 to the present? No. Meetings about litigation matters um, from 2013 to the present? Not that I recall. Okay. So switching gears in 2019, um, did you have a conversation with Mayor de Blasio about your interest in serving as Corp Counsel? In 2019, after Zach announced that he was retiring, we had conversations about I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just like the mask right and now. everything, it's fine. Um, right. In 2019, after Zach said that he was going to retire, the mayor and I did speak about my interest in remaining at the law department, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to do next. After I left the law department, we had a, a conversation of that nature. Um, so, you know, we, we asked some pre-hearing questions that uh, this committee sent you in advance, uh, being asked whether you were offered the position of Corp Counsel. Um, no, I was not. No, I'm sorry, no what? I, I, no, I was not offered the position before now. Okay, but you had a conversation about it. We, we did talk about the position, yes. Um, just why didn't you disclose the conversation then in the pre-counsel uh, hearing, uh, pre-counsel questions? I, I can't. Why didn't you disclose the conversation in the pre-council questions? The pre-council question was whether I had ever been offered the position, and I have not been offered the position. Okay, so just clear, we, but you had the conversation. Whether we, we talked legal. about, I okay. mean, it was a couple of, like, freewheeling conversations. Okay. Uh, for me, just, just circling back, so going back to the COIB issue, in retrospect, would you have done it differently and asked COIB for a formal opinion or letter uh, when you first... Um, you know, had that supervisory position, and then later when you became acting corp counsel, would you have done? Would you have done this differently? Yes. And and requested the letter. Request, I would have requested the letters earlier. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The council has experienced a number of issues with the law department related to basic client services, which the speaker alluded to before. <clears throat> if confirmed, do you commit to create a new mandatory training or to <clears throat> refine existing programs on the following topics? And please answer after I ask about each one. Will you add training for law department attorneys? I, I left my glasses home. Instructing them to inform the appropriate city council attorneys that an action has been filed in which a duly enacted city law is challenged <clears throat> or a council member, the council, or a council staffer is named as a party in their official capacity. <clears throat> uh, yes, we do currently have a system when a council law is challenged. Uh, we notify the chief of our legal counsel division, Stephen Lewis, and he uh, alerts the council and, and links up the lawyers that are going to work together from the council and our office. With respect to notifying council that a member of the council has been sued in their official capacity, we usually find out from the council member, but we can close that loop and make sure that um, council legal staff is also aware, but we can add that to training. If that's a question about adding it to training, yes. Will you add training for law department attorneys, instructing them to promptly send all things, all filings in city council cases to the appropriate city council attorneys? Uh, 
I think we can do that for the council because you're not sued all that often. Uh, so we can arrange that and well, thankfully knock wood um, and that we can we can do that if they want to see every piece of paper sometimes they don't whatever they want on on litigation would be fine okay I mean I've been here 22 years in the in capacity and I have never had to deal with the corporation council but I don't even know anybody that is in the corporation council it's like everybody keeps to themselves and isn't a part of the rest of yeah, the, corporation, the institution. Our lawyers, sorry, our, our lawyers primarily work with your lawyers. Um, occasionally we, we meet with the council members themselves, but it's really mostly lawyer to lawyer. Will you wear training for law department attorneys instructing them to send any letter or stipulation to the appropriate city council attorneys before sending it or filing it with the court? I, I will instruct our lawyers and train them that they should have conversations with um, city council legal staff to find out how much they want us to send them. Sometimes it's just a lot that's not really um, relevant or useful, but if they want to see it, it, that's fine. So we can we can ensure that there's that conversation that happens up front on the case. Will you wear training for law department attorneys, instructing them to provide draft uh, drafts of briefs to the appropriate city council? attorneys for comments at least the three business days before they are due with the exception of reply briefs? Uh, that's hard. Uh, our attorneys and are usually, when it's a, a case of substance that's important to the council, our attorneys are generally working closely, drafting and, and preparing the arguments together. So the arguments in the briefs are not going to be a surprise, but three business days before they're due, I just you know, don't think that that is something that I can commit that we would always be able to do, timelines and, and pressure of work. Uh, sometimes doesn't allow for the three days, but I can say we would give you as much time as we possibly can. I mean. I would say with a thousand uh, attorneys working for Corporation Council, three days doesn't seem so hard. Well, sometimes you only have five days altogether, and we have 80,000 cases. Will you wear training for junior law department attorneys to describe the basic functions and structure of city government, including that? The city council is the legislative branch of government and is co-equal to the mayor. We have um, a terrific training program on the structure of city government that is presented at least once a year. Uh, we can look at it and see if it needs freshening, but we've, we've been develop delivering that training at least annually for a long time now. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to open it up now to my colleagues, uh, Councilmember Powers. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and so thank you for being here today. And congratulations you. on your nomination. Um, just a quick question. One is I want to follow up with a question the speaker had, which was about the role of the council filing amicus briefs, and also I think your response had noted perhaps there are instances where an individual council member might you might think that was a reasonable reasonable for an individual council member to file an advocacy brief being that they're not representing the agency or the body here, they're representing themselves and their community. I just want to clarify that since it's an issue that's come up in the past in this council and in previous councils, which is the role of individual council members. I just, want to, I just wanted to maybe you could restate your opinion just so I could hear that again on what the individual role or what the role or where, where you think amicus, amicus beefs from either the city council or from individual members would be appropriate? So for individual members, um, 
I would say that, or have said that, uh, they, if they want to submit an amicus brief for or against a position that's advanced by the city in litigation, we would, just like any party, bo you know, both parties get to decide whether they're going to tell the court, no, don't take it. Um, but it would be evaluated as um, a proposal to submit amicus like anybody else. So do you have something useful to say that the court should hear? And will it delay the proceedings? So is it going to, you know, are you going to say, I need two weeks to submit the amicus brief that could delay things and it might be a, well, if you could do it in one week, but my, my view is that that is a different situation than the council as a body. The so, so a conflict where the council member, the council as a body wanted to file, decided to file an amicus brief on an issue that we feel is important. The mayor and, and has a disagreement or that or it's even in conflict, direct conflict with, or challenging a decision of the executive that would you would find that to be a conflict between the if, if it went to yes if it if it was a dispute or a disagreement with the administration that went to the powers of the council then we would authorize you the council depending we might def, we might take the council side against the mayor that that's possible too we and then the other side would ha be authorized to get uh, retain outside counsel. Are there instances in your, I think, 33-year career where the law department has sided with the council against the mayor? Um, I, most of my 33 years, it wasn't on the executive staff. So let, um, in the last, uh, let's say, eight or nine years, I can't really think of any. The, the, there's not a lot of mayor versus council cases sure. in that time period either. <laughs> sure. I, th I think the speaker's questions earlier, though, were trying to make a point that it often feels like we are left to, and le sort of left in conflict at moments where, or, or left to the, the, you know, the law department sides with the mayor on these instances where there might be a potential, there's a conflict. Um, just moving on though, um, we had recently seen a number of affirmative cases at the state level, for instance, with the opioids, uh, the opioid crisis, where there was a hu you know, huge settlements um, and I, I was just, in light of that, I was thinking about that earlier and thinking, are there, are there areas where you think the city would benefit from taking affirmative litigation? And when do you think that's important or practical? Um, the city has, does take a lot of affirmative litigation and we created um, a small unit called the Impact Litigation Unit a few years ago that is dedicated to bringing, well, for a long time we were dedicated to bringing cases um, challenging some Trump administration ish initiatives. Um, one of the cases, or two of the cases that we brought are against the opioid manufacturers and distributors and were part of the settlements that were announced. The, the amounts aren't calculated yet because it, it's a co right, right. complicated allocation formula. So we did, we are involved in that and we are also have been exploring more cases under the city's consumer protection law because that's a, that's a valuable tool. So yes, that is something that we are very interested in doing and if uh, the council has ideas on more litigation we could bring, love to hear them. Got it. And what do you feel is the most important part of your office? You've been there for a long time. I'm assuming you've worked in different parts of the office. What do you feel is the most important function of the law department? I, I think I, I got to this a little bit in the in the in the discussion with the speaker that I think we could be an honest broker sometimes, um, and that because we have so many clients with different uh, powers and, and authorities and interests, that if we can uh, convince you all that we are indeed a neutral, I think that that is a, a role that we can play in helping to achieve consensus and, and figure out a way forward for the city in some areas that you know, maybe people have disagreements on. So th I think that is a very important role and I would love to play it more. Got it, I'll just ask two more questions out of respect for my colleagues' time. Just settling claims against the city, uh, can you just give us some sense of your approach to that? I think that different administrations have a different approaches to that, Giuliani versus Bloomberg, so forth and so on. Is there a particular approach or? The, the, the charter gives the authority to settle cases for money, the money cases, to the law department, the corporation council and the controller together. So we are litigating the case and at some point realize 
sometimes early, sometimes late, that this is a really a uh, settlement is in the best interest of the city and we go to the controller's office with our proposal as to how the case ought to be settled. Um, that relationship actually works well um, and there's always a, a respectful give and take on the amounts and, and um, negotiation of it. So I don't think that I would change that at all. And my, my, just my final question, are there areas that you see right now where you would think about expanding the power or changing the power or role uh, or, or doing something different than your predecessors when it comes to this role and uh, how it functions, how it works? Well, from the discussions that the, that the speaker in raised, I think that there is some repairs that need to be made to the relationship and, and a restoration of our credibility and, and a send, to give you all a better sense that we are your lawyers too. We take that role very seriously and I thought, um, and I think that the maybe the lawyers on the ground feel that more, um, but I think that that is an important topic it would be important for me to invest time in that. Okay. Thank you for taking time and I'll uh, hand it back to the chair. Thanks. The Thank chair you. Thank you. Thank you, chair. Um, congratulations Thank for you. your the, the nomination. And I think looking at your, you know, resume is a very impressive record, especially of your um, work in the Cork Council. Uh, in the law department. Um, my question is that following what uh, your conversation with our speaker, I mean, we do look forward to sort of really working more closely together between the city council um, and the law department because of our legislative role. And one of the things that I wanted to ask is that how many s staff are are there a number of staff that are dedicated uh, to work with the council on our legislation? Because one of the concerns I have is that frustration is that oftentimes everything waits till the last minute. You know, the legislation that we're working on and then like we have to, um, what's that called with the late, uh, the final negotiation the okay. laid on the table, the desk, <laughs> and it's like always last minute. And like, I remember there were legislation that I had to wait, stayed up until past midnight to get it finally, you know, settled. Uh, so I guess my question to you is that since what you said it earlier, I mean, you, the Corp Council is the, the chief, you know, legal officer for the whole city and Council is part of the city. And so I hope to see that closer working relationship that will help facilitate, you know, passage of law that are important to our constituent, to our city, that we really work closely on that and not like have the frustration and everything waiting till the, the last minute. So I'm asking to see if you can make a commitment to really working closely with council legal staff. Uh, and to make sure that we get legislation done on time. I know that we, there are a lot of issues that have to be you know, dealt with, make sure that it's, you know, that we don't get sued on it or, or all those issues that comes up. But in terms of timing wise, there's gotta be a better way of dealing with it. <laughs> Thank you, Council Member Chin. I totally agree there's gotta be a better way to deal with it. Um, we have a legal counsel division that is um, a little over tw maybe between 20 and 25 lawyers when they're fully staffed and they share your frustration that things come at the last minute and sometimes there's a lot of things that need to be worked out and there's an aging deadline and everybody's frustrated and, and talking past each other. So I, we would love to work out a better way that where there is um, longer lead time before sort of, okay, this is what's gonna age um, and the legal staff of our office and, and, and council work together to take care of any problems and consult with the council members um, so that it's not a mad crush and nobody is up until midnight or past midnight uh, hoping that it gets done. So yes, we need to figure out a better way. So I, I guess you will make that commitment under your leadership that this will definitely improve, right? I'll do my part. I hope the council does their part. How's that? 
Well, we're looking forward to uh, improving that working relationship. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Ms. Posada, it's very nice to see you in person. It's good to see you too. And congratulations uh, on your nomination. We're um, so happy to have you um, give your testimony here um, to this body today. Uh, along the same lines as my colleagues um, have asked, I just have two questions for you. The first one has to do with you being the leader of the entire law department. And of course, um, we know that uh, change with change always comes a little bit of resistance. So with your commitment to making your non-mayoral uh, clients more balanced when it comes to the law department, how much resistance do you foresee within the department of making that become a reality? I don't foresee resistance. I, I think that the lawyers at the law department are like me, that they really are there because they want to do the best for the city, and, um, and they really do think of their client as the city, and not so much the mayor or the council or the borough president, but it's, okay, what is it for the city? So I don't expect resistance. I think it's uh, partly, and I'm sorry, I don't remember who raised it, but I think probably the speaker, making sure that the conversation is ongoing and, and that the voices of the council are included and heard, particularly on initi initiatives that are important. Um, okay, thank you. And um, my last question has to do with your uh, pre-hearing response to question nine. And the question was, if there is a dispute regarding a litigation tactic, or suggested revisions to a brief to be filed on behalf of the city council, a city council member, or any other non-mayoral city entity between the relevant city attorneys on behalf of the agency and the assistant corporation council handling, or I'm sorry, and the assistant corporation councils handling the case, how do you think such a dispute should be resolved? And your response um, was, was a little vague. I would like for you to ex expound on your thought a little bit. Um, with regard to the answer to that question, uh, you state um, that you try very hard to resolve disagreements through thoughtful and respectful discussion and can usually come up with a satisfactory path forward. But I'd like for you to I expand on that thought a little bit more. So it, it begins at the staff level, the attorneys handling the matter and the council and the Council at the council uh, staff trying to work out the the differences and the disagreements and slowly it rises up I guess in both uh, at both the council and at the law department and ultimately it would come if no agreement could be reached ultimately it would come to me and as the chief legal officer I would be called upon to make the decision as to which way we would go but I you know, have to take into account the concerns of my clients um, because, as I said before, the client knows the operations and what is most important to them. So it's important to listen and and try to address the concerns as best we can before we we take the step forward. But ultimately, it is the obligation of the corporation council to make the decision. Okay, thank you. I, I think I just extracted what I needed to hear is that you would take the lead on that. Um, oh yeah, it's got to be on that. Yeah, yeah, which I didn't see here. So thank you very much for your testimony today. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Rose. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> and um, I too want to offer my congratulations on your nomination. Thank you. Um, I, I have um, some sort of process questions. Um, is there, are, are there a backlog of cases that um, the law department has? And how long does it take for a case to actually get litigated, like from the time it's filed until the time of settlement? So that n not every case is the same, and we all know that this past year has been a little strange, so the courts were not moving as quickly. So we'll we'll pay for that in the in the coming years. But in the ordinary times, in state court, it's not unusual for a case to be five, eight, ten years old before it comes to conclusion. 
in the federal courts, it moves much faster, usually you know, two years, um, three maybe, um, the, to the conclusion. And, that, and by the conclusion, I mean that's a case that's fully litigated, not necessarily settled. Earlier settlements is some, if we see a case that needs to be settled or we decide settlement is the right result here, we try to do that as early as possible to avoid um, you know, delay and spinning of wheels and a growing, ba growing a backlog. Is there anything that you can do internally to expedite that these cases so that it, it doesn't, that that time frame can be reduced? It, it's, is we, it a matter of staffing? Is it a matter of, you know? It, it's, it's, I think a, a few different things and, and you know, if one thing that did come out of the pandemic is that we started meeting regularly with um, uh, the chief, the deputy chief administrative judge in New York um, to come up with a, a mediation program that might fast track so, the resolution of some cases. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had, since the courts weren't fully operational, they were operational for the entire time, but not people were, couldn't come in. That was a productive thing for us to work on with them. So we need to partner more with the court system to find things like that that would help eliminate some of the delays. And um, in terms of, uh, of lawsuits that are filed against the city um, by a sort of repeat multiple lawsuits that we've, you've had to litigate against the same person. Uh, I'm speaking um, primarily about police officers that come before you that um, have had multiple lawsuits. Um, is there some sort of process that uh, that they're looked at and so that the city isn't you know constantly you know being held held liable for the actions of repeat um, police yes. officers who find themselves you know being sued yes um, we have a, a risk management unit that is that looks at things like that looks to see if there are repeat defendants um, or even patterns that are arising in particular precincts or, or something like that and we have weekly that risk unit meets weekly with the NYPD's risk unit and flags these uh, individuals as well as any trends that we see from the incoming cases um, to the police department and they have an early intervention unit that also sort of digs deeper to see sort of, we just have the piece that involves litigation. They have, they have access to more and can dig a little deeper and see what's going on there and, and try to um, take some action. Um, and my last question, um, could you just tell me uh, what your feelings are about qualified immunity and, um, and the law department? It, it's hard to answer a question like that in, in the abstract. Uh, qualified immunity is not, um, you know, I think is a little bit misunderstood in, in terms of how useful it is in, in a typical uh, police excessive force case. It's rarely granted. So I, I just don't, can't answer that in the abstract, I'm sorry. Okay, well thank you so much. Thank Council you, Member, Council Member Lander. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Kozlowitz, and I would just want to thank you uh, for this hearing at all, and I want to uh, praise both the speaker and the members of the council staff who made sure that this got on the 2019 Charter Revision Commission. I think being able to do advice and consent with Corporation Council is a really good step forward for the council and for the city, so thanks to you and to the council and the team and, and the speaker. Uh, Ms. Bastan, it's great to see you here this morning. Congratulations on your nomination. Obviously, the law department is a place of uh, great esteem, uh, you know, I, I count myself fortunate to have learned from 
uh, Fritz Schwartz and Victor Kovner and Zach and Jim Johnson. So it's, uh, and I just wonder if it's just even listing them. It's all men. It's great to have your nomination. And as you say, it's great to see someone who's really spent their whole career working, you know, in the city legal position. So um, congratulations. I'm enthusiastic about your nomination. It seems to me there's sort of two different uh, maybe kinds of issues at stake here. One is, are you appropriate to lead the law department about which to me it's pretty open and shut question that you're you know, qualified and have the integrity and, and wisdom and experience to lead the Thank law you. department and that's kind of our, you know, uh, the, the main part of our advice and consent function. Then there are these questions about how to understand the relationship and role on which we might have some disagreements. And you know, I have enormous esteem for Fritz and Victor and Jim and, uh, and Zach, but I've agreed with, disagreed with some of them on these issues. So that's a, a somewhat separate question. So I'm gonna continue asking a couple of these questions about the role, uh, but just so you know, from my point of view, they really are not questions about your qualifications to lead the department. So I, I'm looking forward to voting yes on your nomination, even if we don't agree on a few of the m matters of sort of how to understand the role and um, in some individual cases. Um, Thank you. And I, I guess I will say, it, it seems to me, I mean, I appreciate everything you've said about working hard to bring parties together and trying hard to represent the city, and I have no doubt you will do that. It does also seem to me just real any corporation council who's been nominated by the mayor, who's working very closely with the mayor, who, you know, when the city is sued, it's generally the mayor's name on the brief, you know, is, is going to have a, a leaning toward the mayor's point of view. And I don't even really have a problem with that. It just seems realistic to me to understand that when different parties within the city might have legitimate different points of view, we need some way of kind of figuring out how to resolve that. And I really like that the first instinct will be, all right, let's try to get people together and let's bring lawyers to the table and see if we can't resolve it. But sometimes politics makes that uh, I impossible or at least extra challenging, and that's okay. I mean, these are, there's a legal point of view for the city and then it's a political, we elect these offices independently and so they may have a different judgment. I, I guess that does on something like um, the situation of the amicus brief make me wonder why the, the simpler answer isn't to say, okay, first I'm gonna try hard to bring people to the table to show why the legal matters reflect a common position, to explain why it would be better if the mayor and the council shared the point of view. But if at the end of the day in a lawsuit, the council, let's say by resolution, I hear that you say it's different for an individual member, but let's say the council feels strongly on a particular suit, the city is being sued or um, there's some point of view, you know, I don't want to use a particular lawsuit because then we'll wind up in a, in a situation, but it's, you know, like the one that, that occasioned the most recent disagreement. Um, and the council by resolution says, you know, we authorize an amicus brief because we have a different point of view than the, than the mayor does. And you've tried to bring people together, uh, expressed why from a legal point of view it would be better. But, but if politically, ultimately, the council were by resolution to say we have a different point of view, um, I guess there's two questions here because it, it seems to me it's reasonable for the corporation council in that case to say we are going to represent the mayor's point of view as the city's point of view. It's the mayor's name who's named on the lawsuit, let's say. And so, um, but it just seems to me it would then be more straightforward to say okay, because there couldn't be resolution here, we deem it appropriate for the council to go ahead and, and proceed and give a little leeway to do it. And it feels to me like that would almost make you a more trusted broker of the city's legal position with an understanding that sometimes politics will make it hard for parties to all come together around it. Yeah, I, I, I do find it hard to discuss these things in the abstract. Um, my, my strong feeling is that because we are putting in a brief or a position on behalf of the city and not the mayor's position, although we're, it's informed by the mayor's position but should be informed by the position of the other branches of government, that mm -hmm. I would be hard pressed at that point. And that there could be a situation where I thought, you know, the council's there's something unique about the council's role or council's view that the court should hear it. 
I will leave open that possibility, but I think for the most part, I would I would um, say that the law department has to take the position on behalf of the city, having tried to be the honest broker in the room and gotten everybody's point of view and come to a legal position on behalf of the city. It's that's that's the position that we put forward. And we want that inclination. I have to say I wouldn't be happier if you gave an answer, which was, okay, the Corporation Council is the mayor's lawyer and everyone else should get their own. That's not what the charter says. It would not be the, how the city was best served. So the goal of bringing people together to represent the city's point of view, I think, is important and admirable, and I'm glad it's your first set of instincts. Um, and I'll actually just maybe say I think you've given useful advice to future councils so that when they see a need to do that, they'll... Uh, want to articulate a rationale for why the council's power or role is implicated and not just we have a different political point of view uh, or a different legal point of view on this on this issue. So I, I'm not going to push any further. To me, it seems like there just is a tension here that it's really understand, you know, it's worth being realistic about. It is the job to be the city's lawyer. I appreciate all the ways you've outlined that you plan to do that. And then sometimes parties are going to make that impossible. And in the cases of those conflicts, it's understandable, at least that the other parties are going to think that Corporation Council leans toward the mayor, whether Corporation Council actually does or, or doesn't. And this helps, having advice and consent hearing is in the direction of having us all feel that way. Um, but, you know, it's, that's just a, um, a, a, political, a political reality. So I, I think it's, anyway, I appreciate your answer. I'll take that advice under advisement in the future if it ever becomes necessary and that you're leaving some room open for that possibility and that you'll consider it yeah. even while you have the strong inclination to try to bring right. people together around a shared and common position. Um, in that vein, you know, I had the experience, a very positive experience around uh, what became known as the dangerous vehicle abatement program law. Uh, of actually being able to work together with both council attorneys from the Office of the General Counsel and attorneys from uh, the law department, uh, as well as Department of Transportation and the sheriff and agencies. That was a situation where everyone had a shared goal of doing something more about the city's most reckless drivers. There were real legal issues about how we could do that in a way that we would feel confident, would withstand court challenge, and would be appropriate. And there was a willingness uh, to all sit down together in a way that I think is not reasonable or practical for every bill that the, that the council is pursuing. I think our normal process will proceed at the volume we're doing it. But in that case, there was a willingness on the part of the council's attorneys, um, uh, the speaker's office, our office, the agencies, and the law department. And it really produced an excellent process in which we reached something that there was a full agreement on uh, on moving through and that passed and the mayor signed it. So I don't know if you've seen opportunities like that, you know, to, to find ways to work to, you know, to kind of, you know, in the ways that the speaker and others have talked about here to um, take steps forward that enable us to work together in productive ways. I, I think that that's a beautiful example of how we want to work with the council going forward. And I do think, you're right, it's not necessary in every bill. Some things are straightforward, but I do think that something like that would address the issue that Council Member Chin raised, that sometimes it's a mad scramble at the end had there been sort of the conversation when there, when there are, um, when it's a complicated bill and, and we all know where we want to get to, but there's dispute or, or, dis or trouble in figuring out the best legal way to get there, I think that that would, uh, would be an excellent tool, that the example that you, you provided um, for, for eliminating some of the problems that, that Council Member Chin was alluding to um, in terms of the uh, aging deadline is coming and we've got a mess on our hands. Um, Thank you. And I, yeah, I found that process very instructive. So, like the chair, I hadn't, I, on the one hand, I, I have the good fortune to have known some corporation councils, but I haven't that directly myself worked with law department attorneys in the job because we work with the attorneys here. And that was, um, you know, helped a lot on that particular bill, but also helped illuminate for me the broader, the broader process. Um, I guess my last question um, sort of builds on that, but also brings in Council pa uh, Member Powers' questions about um, claim settlements, in which case there's the, you know, this particular role for the Office of the Comptroller. In that situation, as I understand it, you know, there had been some prior 
not disputes, but less alignment around kind of getting to shared point of view and the controller, the current controller hired some new staff uh, to help advise him who had experience in claim settlement and that that actually then sort of helped, at least as the story has been told to me, um, you know, the, the different sets of people have good dialogue. Um, and I think there is a challenge, whether it's for council members or for other controller borough president, other office holders, where on the one hand, the corporation council is our lawyer and we wanna work together and take that advice. And on the other hand, for understandable reasons, we hire our own attorneys <laughs> to give us advice on our own points of view. And that would be, that's obviously true here. There's a great staff of lawyers at the city council who advise us. Um, it's true for the comptroller in the claims uh, function or other functions. Um, so, you know, I, I guess how would you encourage uh, other, you know, elected officials other than the mayor who are going to be engaging legal counsel to help advise them in the functioning of their duties to think about that role, what they're looking for, what kind of advice we want, and then how to, um, you know, you know that sets up, then there's gonna be two sets of lawyers, so maybe they'll agree sometimes and maybe they won't agree sometimes. And how should, how, you know, how would you encourage us to, to proceed in, uh, in hiring people for those positions and then approaching the challenge of sort of reaching a common point of view? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that there's lots of lawyer jokes about lawyers' inability to reach an agreement on, on most things. But the I, what's most important for, I think, the lawyers at, at any of the elected's offices, as well as at our agencies, is a willingness to collaborate and have a, a an exchange of ideas. I have found that the legal staff at the council and at um, the controller's office and at other uh, elected officials' offices are really thoughtful, top-notch, and have good, uh, contributions to make and are very valuable to get in on the ground floor when we're talking about these things so that uh, about complicated issues or trying to resolve how do we get to the goal here um, so collaboration and a willingness to hear and work with other lawyers and not uh, you know I know best uh, kind of attitude uh, is is really what I look for I appreciate that and I think it's a good, you know, to me it's uh, all these things are true. We, we, we've got independently elected, elected officials, that's good for having a, a wide diversity of representation. They need good advice uh, and thoughtful approach and people who can advise them and then of course we want to try our best on behalf of the city that we all uh, have the sacred duty to represent to try to figure out how to collaborate as much as we possibly can and get to that common position. So. Um, thank you for answering our questions today. Um, I have no doubt you'll be a, a, an outstanding corporation counsel. I have no doubt there actually will be some times we disagree uh, on matters and that the, the thing that this will help us do is navigate that productively um, and as much as we can in the best interest of the city. So thank you very much, good luck to you. Thank uh, you, good luck to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and thank you to the chair and my colleagues. Thank you. Since there are no other people from the public that signed up to testify <clears throat> or ask questions, we want to thank you, Ms. Pestana, and everyone who participated in today's hearing. We will now recess today's hearing and reconvene on Thursday, July 29th at 11 a.m. <clears throat> for a vote on Ms. Pastina's confirmation. The, the July 27, 2021 meeting of the Committee on Rules, Privileges, and Elections, it now stands in recess. Thank you. <coughs> this, is, this is one of our longest meetings.